Section 2.1, a preview of calculus. There are two related branches of calculus. There's differential calculus and then there's integral calculus. Each of these branches came out of a search for a solution to a particular problem. In this section we're going to look at the process that led to each of these two branches coming out. The first is differential calculus. And differential calculus is the study of instantaneous instantaneous rate of change at a point. That is, we want to know the slope of a function at a particular point. So in this example, we actually want to know the slope of this point right here, the point A, F of A. We want to know the slope of that green line. That is the tangent line. And that is a, as evidenced over here. That is our tangent line. All of these other lines intersect that, that function at two places. So this orange line crosses twice there. That is called a secant line. And what we actually do is we begin with the slope of a secant line. We can find the slope of the secant lines and as our points where they cross, as they get closer and closer to this point, it approaches that green line. That's just the idea that we're going to use with limits as we get through this chapter. So let's estimate in example one the slope of the tangent line or the rate of change to f of x equals x squared at the point x equals one. But we're going to find the slope of secant lines through one one and some other points. Now this equation for the slope of the secant line is f of x minus f of a divided by x minus a. We're actually given the outputs here. So in this case, the point 1, 1 is our a f of a. So that is f of x, that will be 4, minus f of a, which is 1 divided by x, 2 minus a, which is 1, I'm going to go ahead and write this in that form. Now finding that, that is 3 over 1. So the slope of our secant line is 3, going through the point 2, 4. Now let's consider the slope of that secant line, but we're going to go through the point 3 halves, 9 fourths f of x minus f of a divided by x minus a. Well, our f of x will be 9 fourths minus f of a, which is 1, divided by x 3 halves minus a, which is 1. That will be 5 fourths and 1 half. So simplifying that, we get 5 halves. So the slope of our secant line is 5 halves. If we repeated this process and allowed the change in x, or the x values to approach 1, if we allowed the change in between our x and a to go to 0 as they get closer and closer together, that will approach the slope of the secant line at that point. Relatedly, we have the idea of average velocity because velocity is the rate of change of position. So if s of t is the position of an object moving along the coordinate axis at time t, then the average velocity of the object over a time interval from a to t, where a is less than t, so let's assume this is the smaller value, or t comma a if it's the other way around, is v average, and it's s of t minus s of a divided by t minus a. So that's the change in position divided by a change in time. And as t is chosen closer to a, the average velocity becomes closer to the instantaneous velocity, just as we were discussing the secant line versus the tangent line. The process of letting x or t approach the value a in an expression is called taking a limit. So thus we define the instantaneous velocity as follows. For a position function s of t, 
the instantaneous velocity at time t equals a is the value that the average velocities approach on intervals of the form a comma t or and t comma a. They must be the same actually as the values of t become closer to a provided such a value exists. So in example two, a rock is dropped from a height of 64 feet. It's determined that its height in feet above the ground t seconds later from zero to t is given by s of t equals negative 16 t squared plus 64. And that is a very common physics formula. When something's dropped it has no initial velocity. So we want to find the average velocity of this rock over the given time intervals and then use the information to guess the instantaneous velocity at a time t equals 0.5. If you notice, the first interval is coming from the left prior to t equals 0.5 and the other is looking at the 0.01 seconds past that. All right, so for our average velocity, okay, so velocity average equals s of t minus s of a divided by t minus a. So that would mean our average velocity here is s of, in this case, our, th our value is 0.5 for a. So this is of the form t comma a. So this would be s of 0.49 minus s of 0.5 using our function notation divided by 0.49 minus 0.5. Now evaluating the function at 0.49 and 0.5 and then I'm going to go ahead and subtract those that would be 0 0.1584 and subtracting the denominator that is negative 0.01. So our average velocity is negative 0.15 negative 15.84. Move the decimal two places. Now finding the other side of that will be much the same. Find s of 0 0.5, 0 0.51 minus s of 0.5 divided by 0 0.51 minus 0 0.5. Again, subtracting these. 0 0.01 is for the denominator and negative 0 0.1616 for our numerator, which means our velocity is negative 16.16. Now those are both in feet per second. Let's go ahead and add that. Now, to make a guess at our instantaneous velocity, our instantaneous velocity, based on those two, appears that it could be 16 feet per second. And applying the derivative, which we'll see in a, another chapter, we can see that it actually is going to approach that. So that would be a good guess. We don't know, but we can make a good guess. The second branch of calculus is integral calculus, and it stems from a slightly different question. Actually, it's more than slightly, it's a very different question. How can we find the area between the graph of a function and the x-axis over an interval a to b? So it turns out that a lot of physics quantities can be interpreted as area under a curve, and in fact, we can think of derivatives and limits in this same context. Just as with velocity, we can estimate the value and then use limits to gain a more accurate answer. So let's begin with this approximation. The area of those rectangles could very well be, and it appears to be very close to the actual area under the curve from A to B, if that's the same curve, and we intend that it is. However, there is some error. There is some error. 
this, for instance, this rectangle is actually over the curve, whereas it's also a little bit under. Over here, most of these are over, but there's also some under. So it's going to be close, but it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be 100% accurate. However, as the number of rectangles increases, or depending on how you define it, as the widths of the rectangles become smaller and approach zero, the sum of the areas approaches the area between the graph f of x and the x-axis over the interval a to b. Integral calculus is the study of integrals and their many physical applications. So for example three, we want to estimate the area between the x-axis and the graph of f of x equals x squared plus one over the interval zero to three by using the three rectangles that were shown here. So a few things need to be determined. These rectangles all have a common width of 1. This is actually very much a geometry problem. Our heights, our respective heights, are 1, 2, and 5. So our area can be found. Our width, our height times our width. So 1 times 1 plus 2 times 1 plus 5 times 1, which is a grand total of, if we actually factored the, the 1 out, I'm going to go ahead and write that this way. If we factor that 1 out and add those, that is going to be 8, so this will be 8 units squared. Now, I would suggest that you actually come back and view this video in a couple of chapters, because many of the concepts that we presented here, this was a very small, short crash course on what we're going to be looking at, a foreshadowing of what's going to come up in the next probably two courses, quite honestly. So look for some of these things as you go through and try to make some of those physical connections.